Chapter 2. The Marvellous Plan George sat himself down at the table in the kitchen. He was shaking a little. Oh, how he hated Grandma. He really hated that horrid old witchy woman. And all of a sudden, he had a tremendous urge to do something about her. Something whopping. Something absolutely terrific. A real shocker. A sort of explosion. He wanted to blow away the witchy smell that hung about her in the next room. He may have been only eight years old, but he was a brave little boy. He was ready to take this old woman on. I'm not going to be frightened by her, he said softly to himself. But he was frightened. And that's why he wanted suddenly to explode her away. Well, not quite away, but he did want to shake the old woman up a bit. Very well then, what should it be? This whopping, terrific, exploding shocker for Grandma. He would have liked to put a firework banger under her chair, but he didn't have one. He would have liked to put a long green snake down the back of her dress, but he didn't have a long green snake. He would have liked to put six big black rats in the room with her and lock the door. But he didn't have six big black rats. As George sat there pondering this interesting problem, his eyes fell upon the bottle of Grandma's brown medicine standing on the sideboard. Rotten stuff it seemed to be. Four times a day, a large spoonful of it was shoveled into her mouth and it didn't do her any, the slightest bit of good. She was always just as horrid after she'd had it as she'd been before. The whole point of medicine, surely, was to make a person better. If it didn't do that, then it was quite useless. So ho, thought George suddenly. Aha! Ho hum! I know exactly what I'll do. I shall make her a new medicine. One that is so strong and so fierce and so fantastic. It will either cure her completely or blow off the top of her head. <clears throat> I'll make her a magic medicine, a medicine no doctor in the world has ever made before. George looked at the kitchen clock. It said five past ten. There was nearly an hour left before Grandma's next dose was due at eleven. Here we go then, George cried, jumping up from the table. A magic medicine it shall be. So give me a bug and a jumping flea. Give me two snails and a lizard's three, and a slimy squiggler from the sea, and the poisonous sting of a bumblebee, and the juice from a fruit of a jujube tree, and the powdered bone of a wombat knee, and one hundred other things as well, each with a rather nasty smell. I'll stir them up, I'll boil them long, a mixture tough, a mixture strong, and then, hee-ho, and down it goes, a nice big spoonful. Hold your nose. Just gulp it down and have no fear. How do you like it, Granny dear? Will she go pop? Will she explode? Will she go flying down the road? Will she go poof in a puff of smoke? Start fizzing like a can of coke? Who knows, not I. Let's wait and see. I'm glad it's neither you nor me. Oh, Grandma, if only you knew... What I have got in store for you. Chapter 3. George begins to make the medicine. George took an enormous saucepan out of the cupboard and placed it on the kitchen table. George, came the shrill voice from the next room. What are you doing? Nothing, Grandma, he called out. You needn't think I can't hear you because you closed the door. You're rattling the saucepans. I'm just hiding the kitchen, Grandma. Then there was silence. George had absolutely no doubts whatsoever about how he was going to make this famous medicine. He wasn't going to fool about wondering whether he put in a little bit of this or a little bit of that. Quite simply, he was going to put in everything he could get his hands on. There would be no messing about, no hesitating. No wondering whether a particular thing would knock the old girl sideways or not. The rule would be this. 
whatever he saw, if it was runny or powdery or gooey, in it went. Nobody had ever made a medicine like that before. If it didn't actually cure Grandma, then it would any then it would anyway cause some exciting results. It would be worth watching. George decided to work his way around the various rooms one at a time and see what they had to offer. He would go first to the bathroom. There was always lots of funny things in the bathroom. So upstairs he went, carrying the enormous two-handed saucepan before him. In the bathroom, he gazed longingly at the famous and dreaded medicine cupboard, but he didn't go near it. It was the only thing in the entire house he was forbidden to touch. He had made solemn promises to his parents about this, and he wasn't going to break them. There were things in there, he had been told, that could actually kill a person. And although he was out to give Grandma a pretty, fiery mouthful, he didn't really want a dead body on his hands. George put the saucepan on the floor and went to work. Number one was a bottle labelled Golden Gloss Hair Shampoo. He emptied it into the pan. That ought to wash her tummy nice and clean, he said. He took a full tube of toothpaste and squeezed out the whole lot of it in one long worm. Maybe that will brighten up those horrid brown teeth of hers, he said. There was an aerosol can of super foam shaving soap belonging to his father. George loved playing with aerosols. He pressed the button and kept his finger on until there was nothing left. A wonderful mountain of white foam built up in the giant saucepan. With his fingers, he scooped out the contents of a jar of vitamin-enriched face cream. In went a small bottle of scarlet nail varnish. If the toothpaste doesn't clean our teeth, George said, then this will paint them as red as roses. He found another jar of creamy stuff labelled hair remover. Smear it on your legs, it says, and allow to remain for five minutes. George tipped it all into the saucepan. There was a bottle with yellow stuff inside it called Dishworth's famous dandruff cure. In it went. There was something called Brillident for cleaning false teeth. It was a white powder. In that went too. He found another aerosol can. Never more pumpkin deodorant spray. Guaranteed it says to keep away unpleasant body smells for a whole day. She could use plenty of that, George said as he sprayed the entire canful into the saucepan. Liquid paraffin, the next one was called, was a big bottle. He hadn't the faintest idea what it did to you, but he poured it in anyway. That, he thought, looked, looking around him, was about all from the bathroom. On his mother's dressing table in the bedroom, George found yet another lovely aerosol can. It was called Helga's Hair Set. Hold 12 inches away from the hair and spray lightly. He squirted the whole lot into the saucepan. He did enjoy squirting those aerosols. There was a bottle of perfume called Flowers of Turnips. It smelt of old cheese. In it went. And in two went a large round box of powder. It was called Pink Plaster. There was a powder puff on top and he threw that in as well for luck. He found a couple of lipsticks. He pulled the greasy red things out of their little cases and added them to the mixture. The bedroom had nothing more to offer, so George carried the enormous saucepan down again and trotted into the laundry room, where the shelves were full of all kinds of household items. The first one he took down was a large box of super white for automatic dishwashing machines. Dirt, it said, will disappear like magic. George didn't know whether Grandma was automatic or not, but she was certainly a dirty old woman. So she'd better have it all, he said, tipping the whole box full. Then there was a big tin of Waxwell floor polish. It removes filth and foul messes from your floor and leaves everything shining bright, it said. George scooped the orange-coloured waxy stuff out of the tin and plonked it in the pan. There was a round cardboard carton labelled flea powder for dogs. Keep well away from the dog's food, it said, because this powder, if eaten, will make the dog explode. Good, 
said George, pouring it, it all into the saucepan. He found a box of canary seed on the shelf. Perhaps it'll make the old birds sing, he said, and in it went. Next, George explored the box with shoe cleaning materials, brushes and tins and dusters. Well now, he thought, Grandma's medicine is brown, so my medicine must also be brown, or she'll smell a rat. The way to colour it, he decided, would be with brown shoe polish. The large tin he chose was labelled dark tan. Splendid. He scooped it all out with an old spoon and plopped it into the pan. He would stir it up later. On his way back to the kitchen, George saw a bottle of gin standing on the sideboard. Grandma was very fond of gin. She was allowed to have a small nip of it every evening. Now he would give her a treat. He would pour in the whole bottle. He did. Back in the kitchen, George went over to the huge saucepan on the table and went over to the cupboard that served as a larder. The shelves were bulging with bottles and jars of every sort. He chose the following and emptied them one by one into the saucepan. A tin of curry powder, a bottle of mustard powder, a bottle of extra hot chilli sauce, a bottle of black peppercorns, a bottle of horseradish sauce. There, he said out loud, that should be it. George, came the screechy voice from the next room, who are you talking to in there? What are you up to? Nothing, Grandma. Absolutely nothing, he called back. Is it time for my medicine yet? No, Grandma. Not for about a half an hour. Well, just see you don't forget it. I won't, George answered. I promise I won't.